um so uh, again uh, thank you very much for the uh, welcome so uh, i am uh, one of the co-founders of uh, yugen uh, dot ai we are a machine learning engineering uh, company so we work with uh, client partners uh, across the globe uh, in uh, you know helping them accelerate their uh, machine learning efforts uh, so we we just like uh, more than a year old uh, and uh, throughout the past year i think we've learned a few crucial lessons in terms of how exactly uh, do we have a framework that helps you know, move from prototype to production uh, how do we ensure that you know uh, our our time to market uh, is within uh, an acceptable limit and uh, you know in in the pursuit of <clears throat> doing that uh, we have a few interesting uh insights and you know certain learnings that we've had uh which i'd like to share with uh, all of you today i assume uh you guys are able to see my screen yeah everything's fine oh, perfect thank you so uh so just a quick um you know understanding of what uh this particular talk is going to concentrate on uh we are mostly going to understand um how you know building ml systems from scratch you know what are the different things that are involved in that process and <clears throat> while we build out these components and while we iterate what are certain things uh that we should have in mind in terms of you know what uh, the north star should be uh as we deep dive into you know these learnings we'll uh, talk about something that we refer to as uh, the minimum achievable goal uh and we will also kind of uh, share <clears throat> certain uh, insights with regards to how do we maintain a healthy balance between you know exploration activities or machine learning model developments or pipelines deployments uh, and all of those things so the idea is that uh, for any machine learning system we you know kind of move from the ideation stage to you know measurement and and successful execution and we kind of repeat this process over and over again um so uh, we are going to kind of uh, focus more on how <clears throat> best to you know cover the journey from the ideation stage to successful execution and uh, you know certain best practices that can kind of uh, help us achieve that so we'll take a specific use case uh, that we've kind of worked on for <clears throat> the past year and hopefully uh, the examples from that use case is going to uh, elaborate uh, you know what uh, this particular uh, journey is supposed to uh, now a quick uh recap about uh you know putting things in perspective as far as machine learning systems are concerned so at the very heart of it uh, there are multiple uh components <clears throat> that are present in a machine learning system so uh typically starts from uh, identifying what a business goal is you know what you know your priorities are and how do you define uh, the scope Uh, of that particular goal so from an overarching problem statement how do you kind of uh, break that down into <clears throat> sub problems or or uh, kind of interim checkpoints that you can then uh, uh, fulfill once we have a particular scope the next step typically becomes you know analyzing your data looking at trends uh, mining insights and and that kind of sets the stage for um you know understanding what has been happening and and potentially what could be the reasons why they are happening and that kind of you know uh, intuitively flows into uh, the feature creation and feature engineering part of it where you know we prepare the training data sets uh, we look at you know different features we transform them and you know kind of uh, get uh, the feature engineering uh, done in a certain manner uh the feature engineering step of course leads to the model development step so this is where you know our data scientists would typically uh try different algorithms uh hyperparameter tuning uh you know offline tests uh, sometimes even <clears throat> uh, real time tests uh, to kind of see uh, how the models performing on historical data is it you know something that that you know we are confident about and you know whether or not that should move to production and typically this also is a kind of a collaborative step where you know multiple uh people in the team uh, kind of share inputs as to you know what uh, uh, the pros or cons of the model can be and you know is there something else that we can try to improve it uh, <clears throat> but at the end 
when we have uh, a particular model that we feel confident about the next step kind of becomes to deploy it and and this is uh, typically the stage where we have uh, you know machine learning engineers or data engineers uh, playing a very crucial role uh, so this is where you know uh, it's it's not only about deploying the model but it, it also involves uh, you know, uh, having pipelines <clears throat> that support your inference or your prediction. So, uh, could be you know, real-time prediction or inference, or it could sometimes even be batch uh, uh, predictions. But at the end of the day, it, it's 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 a very very fairly common use case to have uh, certain data pipelines support your inference pipelines. And this, of course, is another place where you know you kind of. Uh, so microservices is one of the very commonly used architecture patterns for deployment. So this is also another uh, area of focus when we think about uh, deployments. And of course, once a model is in deployment, it's essentially facing uh, uh, the test of time and reality. So uh, it's very crucial to kind of measure uh, not just the performance of the model, but also the performance of the system. So again, uh, as we discussed, it, it, it's very much possible that the entire architecture is going to have multiple components. Uh, typically, if you look at like a, a serverless uh, pipeline or any other microservice-based uh, pattern. So uh, apart from um, measuring how the models perform, it's, it's equally important to understand how the microservices perform. So, you know, you, we may have, let's say, five ETL jobs that are running. Uh, you know, at the, at the end of every run, uh, are we kind of seeing uh, on, on a ballpark level, the number of you know, users we would expect, uh, things like that. So uh, that pretty much <clears throat> uh, is another crucial part of it. And of course, once we measure, we kind of go back to the drawing board and uh, you know evaluate where we've been, how far we've been able to reach, <clears throat> so on and so forth. And then this entire process kind of keeps on uh, repeating itself. So uh, uh, you know, taking a step back um, at, at the very you know machine learning systems by design have a certain amount of, uh, you know, uh, it, it, it's a multi-dimensional problem to solve. So uh, you typically have a lot of things uh, that you need to keep in mind. So, uh, and, and that can vary across different organizations. So typically if you're, uh, <clears throat> say, uh, in, in, a, in a startup, uh, often you see data scientists and machine learning engineers, you know, wearing one person wearing the hat. So uh, it becomes important for them to kind of balance their work and kind of plan out the entire thing. Uh, for a for someone who's a say someone like a data science manager, it becomes equally important for them to kind of uh, uh, set up <clears throat> the entire architecture or or architect the system in such a manner that uh, he or she sets up uh, the entire team for success. So managing all of these different components uh, uh, are pretty crucial and uh, they do determine how successful uh, the project uh, becomes. So we'll kind of uh, take a specific use case and uh, see how, at least in our experience, we've been able to implement this for one particular problem state. Now, before um, going into the details of our architecture deployment patterns, uh, just a quick um, you know, uh, introduction to what the problem statement is and you know what we are trying to achieve so this is uh, you know uh, something that we are uh, working with for 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 a, a client that's in the mobile uh, uh, advertising space so typically what uh, they do is uh, they serve ads to users and you know once the user clicks on the ad or views the ad uh, that counts as a conversion and and uh, you know, typically advertisers pay for that particular conversion. So that kind of results in <coughs> revenue. Um, so the idea was to, you know, have a personalization engine, a re recommendation engine, which works real time. And the goal was to, you know, have the recommendation engine drive conversions or maximize conversions. Uh, in terms of, you know, our beginning point, uh, this was a very <clears throat> nascent uh, uh, product when you know we kind of started working on it. Uh, the product was live in around uh, four to five countries. There was no existing uh, ML pipeline back then, and uh, this was simply you know business rules and heuristics that were used to determine uh, the ad ranking. So <clears throat> our goal was to kind of bring in. Uh, more rigor into that process and, and kind of set up that pipeline so that you know, we could start um, achieving uh, 
the expected convergence. <clears throat> Now, before we move on, or, or before we kind of understand the architecture, uh, uh, there's one thing that I had referred to earlier, which was uh, the concept of a minimum achievable goal. Uh, and in practice, we've seen uh, uh, that, you know, the, the understanding of having a minimum achievable goal, or at least following it as, as much as we can, typically results uh, in, 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 in great execution. <clears throat> and, and that's because it kind of uh, sets... Uh, or freezes the scope and uh, it becomes very easy for each and every person to understand what has to be done, what's the goal uh, and kind of makes the entire process something that uh, that's set up for success. So the way we, uh, and of course we've gone through multiple iterations uh, over the last year to kind of, uh, you know, fine tune this concept uh, over time. But the idea is that, you know, we, we define a minimal achievable goal as, as, as a deliverable <clears throat> which, uh, if, if taken to production, achieves uh, an acceptable uh, level of uh, value addition. Uh, sorry, just this. Uh, sorry, were you guys? Oh, sorry, my bad. Yeah, uh, which is <clears throat> um, uh, something that, uh, you know, and, and a minimum level of impact that we want to create. And, uh, and the way we define acceptable level is something that multiple stakeholders can agree on. So uh, when typically when you're working on a machine learning project, it's, it's very much possible that, uh, you know, we have uh, product managers, uh, uh, working with us we have you know an, an engineering team or, or business stakeholders so uh, the way we define an acceptable level is something that you know, pretty much all stakeholders can agree with and, and therefore uh, that's an agreed impact that uh, everyone needs to take um, the other feature of the minimum achievable goal is that it uh, kind of sets future releases or, or sets a process that makes future releases uh, pretty easy so uh, you could define KPIs such as, you know, I, I want to be able to deploy a new and improved model, uh, say, every four weeks. Or you could say that, you know, you want to roll, roll out small A-B tests uh, or minor experiments uh, every two weeks. Or, you know, you could kind of change certain configurations in your parameters and, and, and that typically deploying that should not exceed, let's say, uh, half a day or a day. So <clears throat> these are certain... Um, uh, checkpoints or requirements that we kind of include as part of the minimum achievable goal. And, uh, you know, this kind of helps us stay focused on uh, a certain set of things rather than be distracted uh, 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 most of the time. Uh, a few examples. So, for example, let, let's say you're working on a particular uh, 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 machine learning model and, and uh, that product is present in, uh, say, uh, 50 countries. Uh, for the minimum achievable goal, you you needn't prioritize all 50 countries or you could just start working on, on just one country. Uh, you could prioritize that. Or you could prioritize, let's say, a, a particular continent or, or let's say cities, of course. Or you could even <clears throat> look at it from uh, a demography perspective. So you could kind of want to uh, identify a particular user segment and then focus on it first rather than... Uh, you know, focusing on all, all user segments. So this kind of helps prove value um, because, again, there's always a certain amount of uh, unexpected uh, returns uh, in <clears throat> as far as machine learning is concerned. So uh, this approach typically uh, helps solve that problem. So this is, <clears throat> um, you know, as far as the problem statement that I had mentioned earlier. So this was the first baseline model release that we had done. Uh, it was uh, pretty much, you know, a plain vanilla, bare bones kind of an architecture. Uh, but at the same time, it was pretty foundational and it enabled us to uh, kind of experiment uh, very quickly. So, for example, <clears throat> we had like a separate uh, model development pipeline and also uh, a model inference pipeline. So, <clears throat> looking at the model development, we had a data warehouse was typically Google BigQuery, uh, and we used 
Jupyter notebooks, which would kind of pull the historical data, would prepare training data, calculate, you know, uh, uh, historical uh, uh, ads, etc., and all of that. And we would then store them as uh, flat files. Uh, we had another kind of pipeline where you know we would take the analytical data set, we would kind of create features, uh, perform certain transformations, and for the first release, we did a simple you know regression algorithm. We kind of tested it on uh, offline and then uh, on the live set of uh, ads that we had, and we felt it was it was at least uh, something that could show promise. And you know, uh, once we were able to get to that stage, we had the output of this particular Jupyter notebook was kind of a model artifact. Um, <clears throat> the model artifact um, was then kind of uh, you know uh, uploaded to uh, S3. Uh, this was programmatically, but then of course not via an ETL pipeline, but uh, still via code. Uh, and apart from that, you know, we also had certain uh, zip files uh, uh, for certain Lambda layers, uh, which we would then upload to Lambda, AWS Lambda. And in terms of inference, um, we had, uh, uh, again, the goal was to have a personalized real-time uh, inference, but of course, like I mentioned, we, we kept the minimum achievable goal, something small and something that you know, we could typically achieve as soon as we can. So uh, instead of having, you know, uh, or, or doing something completely real-time, what we started was, you know, with a kind of a batch uh, of, uh, inference. So <clears throat> we'd have a ETL code, which would uh, fetch all uh, live ads that we had. Uh, it would calculate the feature values of all those uh, live ads and it would kind of make a post request to uh, an API gateway. <clears throat> the API gateway was kind of a trigger to uh, the AWS Lambda. So the AWS Lambda would receive all you know, currently live uh, ads <clears throat> and their features from uh, the API gateway or, or, or the request that was made and it already had uh, the zip files for you know layers such as let's say pandas, numpy, or any other dependencies that that uh, we typically needed, and it also had the model artifacts. So uh, it was set up to perform inference, certain amount of post processing, adding certain metadata, and then once it was done, it would kind of typically write <coughs> the ranking file to S3, and and this was our ETL job that ran every kind of you know uh, fifteen minutes, and of course once the ranking file was present, you know this would be used for downstream processes where you know, kind of it would be shown in the UI for uh, users to kind of uh, take a look. Now, once we had our first baseline release, uh, you know, there were two different uh, or, or parallel approaches that we could have taken. Uh, the one was, you know, we could have focused more on uh, building new models or we could have focused more on uh, you know, setting up the stage uh, or, or kind of improving the amount of automation that was going on. Uh, and, and like I mentioned, this was, um, or the product was pretty much in, in, a, in a nascent stage. So we had uh, uh, new you know, integrations or, or, or tying up with new partners. Uh, you know, we were expanding to new countries and uh, product was getting more traction, so we had new users coming in as well, and and these users typically were, uh, in terms of you know their <clears throat> behavior, uh, were a little different from some of the early adopters of the product. So, what we realized was that uh, for this particular use case, our um, you know we would end up making a lot of uh, or implementing a lot of experiments. So this would not be a case where you know we roll out a model once a month. This would probably be something where we roll out a model every uh, week or, or around two weeks. So which is why we decided to kind of prioritize uh, the automation uh, or the deployment aspect of uh, the pipeline. So our next release or our next phase was more focused on automation. So uh, wherein you know earlier we just had the model. Uh, uh, artifacts being um, uploaded to uh, S3 via code, but not via, uh, let's say, a, a particular uh, CI CD process or via GitHub Actions. What we decided to do was kind of you know build out the automation here. So we focused on uh, having the inference code, uh, the model artifacts, uh, all uh, deployed uh, and and uh, update the Lambda. And this was via GitHub Actions and kind of a CI CD process. 
at the same point in time we also realized that you know because there's going to be more focus on automation we should kind of set the stage for uh, ab tests <clears throat> so which is why we kind of uh, modified the, con- the, the, co- the configurations that we had in the etl code where you know it would, it would make it like instead of one request uh, earlier it would make like two different requests one for uh, the a test the other one for the b test and automatically <clears throat> uh, the lambda instead of writing one uh, uh, you know, ranked list of uh, ads would uh, start writing, you know, uh, two or multiple uh, such uh, uh, ranked files and, and, and that output would then be showed to the users depending upon whichever test bucket uh, they belong to. But yes, uh, we, we placed our bets on um, uh, automation because, you know, that kind of seemed the right thing to do because, you know, we, we imagined that uh, you know, there would be a greater ROI in automation at that point in time, rather than uh, focusing more on on, on model uh, developments. Uh, and and this foundational choice kind of helped us in the future immensely, um, which is because once we had this entire uh, pipeline set up, <clears throat> what we could then do was uh, expand uh, pretty quickly. So at the very beginning, when we had a baseline release, we had focused on just one country, uh, and now you know we could focus on you know multiple countries at a time so we started building out one model personalized to each and every country it was still for users it was still uh, user agnostic but at least you know, we could kind of uh, make different models for every country uh, you know from from a very uh, elementary or rudimentary linear regression we could then move on to generalized linear models and random forest regressors uh, essentially tree based algos and, and that kind of helped us <coughs> get um, uh, better ROIs as well, um, and and in in addition uh, to kind of expanding to multiple geographies and kind of you know doing a horizontal expansion, the other thing that we understood was that because we had set the stage for uh, A/B tests in the previous release, this would also be an optimal time uh, or an opportune time to kind of uh, set up the stage for measurements. So our data warehouse, uh, which was in BigQuery, we kind of connected that to uh, Google Data Studio, and uh, you know we had kind of automated queries which ran, uh, which looked at the different historical data. It would measure uh, the performance of different algos and you know how they perform uh, against one another. So you know which out of let's say if you're running an A/B test uh, and it's across three countries, so you could always always see <clears throat> which algorithm is performing better and certain deep dives that help us understand why it's performing. So we had uh, kind of decided to uh, have the measurement aspect built in uh, as, as well. And the inference pipeline, of course, remained the same, uh, uh, the ETL to API gateway, Lambda, and S3. Uh, and uh, again, a 15-minute batch process rather than something that was real-time. Once we expanded to multiple countries, um, we kind of... Uh, you know, were in a better place because there was a certain amount of personalization that was going on by country. But if, of course, our eventual goal was to get to you know user level personalization. So one, uh, uh, you know, again, uh, uh, going back to the concept of uh, uh, the minimum achievable goals, so instead of taking the the one leap from <clears throat> user agnostic to to directly um uh, user personalized models we decided to kind of uh, go to an intermediate stage uh, and so here we kind of uh, started building out uh, personalized models for user segments <clears throat> uh, the, the another reason why we kind of made this design choice was because uh, we also understood that our current inference pipeline uh, had its shortcomings so if we wanted to try multiple algorithms uh, and even some of the more <clears throat> sophisticated ones, especially let's say learning to rank algorithms and all of that, uh, the lambda uh, approach would not uh, typically help because of the 250 MB uh, zip uh, limit that we have. Of course, uh, uh, this is before, much before uh, this year's uh, reinvent when lambda launched uh, container support. Uh, so at that point in time, we of course did not have that option. Uh, but of course, we did want to get to a stage where. Uh, you know, uh, we are able to re-architect that system. And, you know, this was kind of uh, a midway between what we currently had and where we wanted to uh, reach. Um, and while we were building out, you know, models for user, different user segments, we could also uh, kind of uh, uh, focus on, you know, incoming new users separately. We could focus on, you know, users who've been in the system or been using the product for a while versus, you know, whales who've used the product who are uh, extremely loyal to the product and, and they 
pretty much frequent product let's say uh, every day or or uh, every alternate day <clears throat> so that helped us <clears throat> um achieve a certain uh, added level of personalization on top of the uh, uh, the user uh, uh, the, the country <clears throat> personalization that we had um and you know uh, we also uh, apart from random forest regressors you know we could also move on to you know uh, ixy boost gradient boost trees etc for each of those uh, uh models that we built <clears throat> and of course uh, one uh, helpful thing was that you know we already had the ci cd process built out so you know moving from model development to uh, production was not something that you know we really had to worry about multiple times and and that was a process that was already in place and therefore uh, it really helped us so <clears throat> the design choice where we made uh, that, that we made after our first baseline release is you know so these are certain uh, advantages or ROIs that we you know later on started realizing because of that choice that we had made and of course uh, the measurement pipeline was also pretty much uh, built out uh now while we kept you know focusing on certain countries or certain user segments uh, and and before we were about to make the final jump to a you know fully user personalized uh, pipeline and user personalized model uh we noticed one thing that you know uh, over time uh, like i mentioned you know we we kind of uh, uh, source our ads from different partners so you know sometimes the characteristics of those ads would change as we launch in different countries the users who come uh, uh, and 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 use the app their characteristics are different uh, and and uh, you know as we kind of uh, acquire more customers the new customers or new users they do not necessarily share the same traits that existing uh, users do so of course we we did notice that you know some of our models uh, their performance uh, was being impacted by concept drift and and that's something that we could easily identify over let's say a few weeks of time is because you know we already had the measurement pipeline built out so uh, at least we could look at different customer cohorts and see uh, you know the number of uh, visits that, that, that they were making or the number of ads that they were clicking on uh, what their you know return rates were and you know was that going reducing over time for a specific segment or was it increasing because uh, for a, for a different segment so on and so forth so that, that was another uh you know at least a helpful uh, directional trigger for us to realize that uh, we do have concept drift uh, that's impacting us so before we took the final plunge towards user personalization we decided to at least take a step back and and dedicate some time to kind of uh, uh, retrain most of our models for you know different user segments and countries <clears throat> and then make that jump so which is why we kind of uh, uh, plugged in this particular uh, um, effort at that point in time uh, of course once we went through these you know multiple uh, steps and we kind of understood uh, uh, you know uh, the business more the users more uh, this kind of helped us uh, transition to a real time you know user personalized system so uh what we have right now is a model development pipeline where <clears throat> we kind of push our codes uh, or or uh, the model artifacts the model features etc uh, to a model uh, release repo uh, there's a uh, pull request that we make and and you know go through uh, a few tests that we have and once all the tests have been cleared uh, we pretty much kind of deploy it via deploy board which takes <clears throat> the model uh, artifacts and and features and kind of uploads it to all the ec2 boxes and it kind of uh, does the same thing for our inference script now our inference uh, at least from a user uh, personalization standpoint uh, you know we need two different things one is what are the different uh, ads uh, that are live in our system and um, uh, you know what are the different features that we have uh, for different users so those are the two inputs that uh, we need to make a real time recommendation so <clears throat> the way we uh, currently do that is uh, by having an airflow uh, uh, etl job which kind of uh, looks at the data warehouse and uh, kind of calculates what the live inventory is at that at at you know this particular point in time and <clears throat> excuse me uh kind of uh, writes it to uh, an inventory bucket in in s3 
Um, of course, you know, inventories don't necessarily change every minute. Uh, it can change like every five minutes or so. So you know, we have our ETL jobs configured that way. So you know, we kind of run this every uh, five to 10 minutes. Uh, and once the, uh, the ETL job is kind of uh, 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 calculates the live ads and their features, uh, what we do is <clears throat> uh, in, in each of these EC2 boxes that we have, we have a Python scheduler, so which kind of pulls in all the inventory <clears throat> and their feature files from uh, S3. We have a similar design uh, uh, in, in terms of having another ETL job for users. <clears throat> uh, although from a design standpoint, there is uh, kind of a slight difference between uh, you know uh, user features versus uh, ads and their features. So in real time, we essentially need uh, the entire ad inventory uh, at, at one time. Have a go. <clears throat> Whereas uh, for users, we don't need the same thing. For users, we need uh, the features for one specific user for every API call. So which is why the ad inventories are you know pretty much in in in, in uh, flat files or, or binary pickle files in S3. <clears throat> Whereas for users, uh, the the Airflow job that we have kind of writes all users and their features to our Redis uh, cluster. Uh, of course, we've kind of experimented with DynamoDB uh, uh, and, and, and Redis both as well. And, and you know, uh, this was, we, we didn't see a huge performance uh, uh, difference, but uh, it was easier for us to move to Redis uh, because of you know, certain existing uh, knowledge base that we had. So which is why we kind of chose Redis, uh, uh, which stores all our uh, user features. <clears throat> so in, in real time, the way inference happens is that, you know, there's an API request, which is made by uh, the client. You know, which is uh, when a user comes in uh, to use the product in the UI and that kind of <clears throat> uh, uh, makes an API uh, call and you know we kind of have a lambda which uh, triggers um, uh, the inference script here so of course the entire application is kind of uh, deployed as a flask application on uh, ec2 boxes and, and there's the load balancer which kind of scales um, as and when needed uh, uh, in, in terms of, uh, you know, the traffic that we receive. Uh, but the idea is that, you know, the Lambda helps uh, kind of, uh, uh, do the, the inference part of it. Uh, another use case, why we need the Lambda is because of course, this is a high level abstraction, but, uh, we, we often have, uh, uh, you know, the inference done in, in multiple ways. So, uh, uh, of course, recommendation engines do face, uh, the cold start problem. So let's say there's a new ad that come that came in like 10 minutes back. 20 minutes back. So we essentially cannot uh, score them uh, the same way we would score ads that have been in the system for let's say the last week or, or, or two weeks. So we do have like multiple uh, such uh, uh, inference pipelines built out uh, rather than just, you know, one inference uh, uh, happening at that particular point in time. So, you know, the Lambda helps you know, paralyze uh, those particular calls and, and, and once it gets the uh, the uh, the ranked ads for that particular user it helps combine and and reconcile uh, those uh, inferences that have happened uh, in parallel. So once of course uh, the lambda has that particular input uh, uh, kind of sends out that response, uh, uh, which again uh, based on which the user gets to see a particular set of uh, ranked ads that they can you know then click on and uh, kind of uh, uh, experience. Uh, the other thing is, and, and this can, kind of ties back to uh, the the measurement part uh, that I was talking about uh, at the very beginning. And, and uh, of course, measurement is uh, typically of uh, uh, two different, or we break it down into two different categories. One, of course, is things like, you know, how is one particular model performing? Uh, you know, you all users who are being served a particular model, <coughs> uh, you know, what is the return rate of those users? How many, uh, you know, clicks are they making and, and how many uh, uh, times do they come uh, and, and, and click an ad and, and how much are they scrolling uh, uh, in the app, uh, things like that. Uh, the other thing is uh, checking the health of different microservices. So, you know, as you would notice from the like bare bones, uh, ETL, uh, Lambda API Gateway S3 and, and CICD, we kind of, uh, had a significant <clears throat> revamp in terms of the number of microservices that we have. Um, so what we do is uh, we kind of um, uh, use new relic 
to monitor uh, uh, the entire you know web application that we have. So it kind of tells us that you know per minute uh, you know this is the throughput. These are the number of errors that happened in uh, you know for for this particular microservice in the last you know thirty minutes, sixty minutes, etc. Uh, the other thing, um, which of course New Relic isn't able to cater to, you know, uh, from the basic design that we have is so this entire application, uh, the inference actually application is something that you know we track by New Relic. But of course, you know, we have our ETL jobs uh, that operate on Airflow, so uh, that of course falls outside the scope of New Relic uh, uh, as of now. So the way uh, right now we of course do not have an automated system in terms of <clears throat> Uh, monitoring those uh, logs, but what we do is we <clears throat> do write uh, those logs to S3, and you know we are able to kind of uh, uh, check that you know this was one uh, particular time where uh, the job failed, and, and you know, it helps us uh, visualize that from uh, the Airflow dashboard, and then also from uh, the logs that we write onto uh, S3, and, and that's applicable both uh, for the the user. Uh, feature or the user data store as well as for uh, the ad inventory store. Uh, the other key aspect, and I'll kind of uh, uh, go back to the model development uh, pipeline, is essentially the model release uh, part of it. So right now, of course, we have, you know, as we've grown as a team, we've understood the importance of uh, or, or uh, the idea of you know, how wide collaboration is important. So of course. Uh, this is one uh, uh, such aspect where we are kind of uh, experimenting more and, and you know exploring multiple tools as to how multiple data scientists can work together and, and how do we optimize uh, the release or, or the model building pipeline, how do we automate that. So that's again another uh, you know, chunk of the pipeline which isn't mentioned here, but, but it, it's uh, another interesting uh, body of work that uh, you know, we plan to embark on. But yes, uh, uh, I think this pretty much brings me to the end of uh, the talk. But the idea being that uh, you know, from a very simple baseline release, uh, you know, which was not uh, user personalized, which was not real time, uh, you know, uh, the idea is to have uh, you know, uh, one or, or or a set of releases that kind of take you from uh, step A or or the ideation stage till the successful uh, execution and you know where you start uh, seeing uh, ROI so this is one you know framework of you know multiple uh, deployments multiple you know ex uh, uh, experimentation and kind of doing it as fast as we can and while while ensuring that you know we have a minimum achievable goal which everyone agrees to and which everyone is confident and, and kind of comfortable with so you know uh, we're able to kind of replicate that success multiple times um so yeah i think um that kind of brings me to uh, the end of what i had to uh, share uh, i think if there are uh, any questions uh, i think we